I am Mrs. Rangwala. You have praised Raja Ram Mohan Roy in your talk. Do you know that he was against parda? Why does Islam degrade women by keeping her behind the way? Isn't a Hindu woman modest in her shalwar kameez? The sister has asked a very good question that I spoke highly about Raja Ram Mohan Roy in my talk and about the reform he brought in Hinduism. But he even spoke against the hijab system that's there in Islam. So do I know about that? And why does Islam degrade the woman by keeping her behind the veil? And is a Hindu woman who does not wear a veil and wear a salwar kameez, is she modest? Sister, you should understand that if I appreciate certain points of a person, that does not mean I agree with all his points. For example, four years back, four years back, the Home Minister of India, Mr. L.K. Adwani, he suggested the law that the rape should be put to death. And I appreciated that he agreed with the Islamic philosophy that the rape should be put to death. But when I appreciated Mr. L.K. Adwani, that doesn't mean I agree with him totally. But I do agree with the suggestion that a rapist should be put to death, same as Islam says. Similarly, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, I appreciate him. He is a great reformer. I really respect him. I also know that he was against the hijab system, which is mentioned in Islam. Now today if we analyze the modesty level of a human being, it differs depending upon the surrounding they live in. For example, there are certain Muslim countries in the Arab land who say that if anyone looks at a woman or stares at a woman, it is considered immodest. Anyone stares at a woman, it is immodest. In India, as long as you don't touch a woman, you are modest. Therefore, while they greet the ladies and the gents, they fold their hands, but they don't touch anyone. If you don't touch a woman, you are modest. In some of the western countries, shaking hands is modest. If a man shakes hands with a lady, it is modest. And if you don't shake hands, it is considered that you are not friendly. In other western countries, if you kiss a woman, that is modesty. If you go beyond kissing, it is immodest. Some western countries, as long as the men and the lady, anything they do, as long as they do willingly, it is modest. So different people have different levels of modesty depending upon where they live. For example, in America, if a lady wears a mini skirt or shorts, she is considered modest. But the same girl, if she comes to India and she wears a mini skirts and shorts, we will say she is immodest. When I gave a talk in America, there was an American who told me, Brother Zakir, do you know the Indian women are immodest? I was shocked. I didn't agree with him. He said, of course. The Indian women, when they wear the sari, they expose their belly. So according to the Americans, exposing the belly is immodest. So depending upon different people, the level of modesty keeps on changing. Let us try and analyze what does our Creator, Almighty God, have to speak about modesty. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30. Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Allah first speaks about the modesty for the man and then of the woman. Whenever a man looks at a woman, any brazen thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. There was a Muslim who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told, brother, what are you doing? It is haram to stare at a woman. He told me, our beloved prophet said, the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited. I have not yet completed half my glance. What did the Prophet mean when he said the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited? What he meant was if you unintentionally look at a woman, do not intentionally look at her to feast on her beauty. That doesn't mean you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying I have not completed my glance. <laughs> the next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Allah says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty, and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of, and draw her veil, a head covering over the bosom except in front of a father 
her husband, her sons, and the big list of mehrams who she cannot marry is given. And the criteria for hijab is given in the Quran, the Sahih Hadith. There are basically six criteria. The first is the extent. That is, the extent for the man is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen is the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second criteria is the clothes they wear, it should not be transparent so that you could see through. The third is it should not be tight fitting so that it reveals the figure. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attacks the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not be clothes which are signs of the unbelievers. And the reason for hijab is given in Surah Azab chapter 33 verse 59 in which Allah says, O Prophet, tell to your wives and your daughters and the believing women that whenever they go abroad, they should put on a cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Suppose there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful and if they are walking down the streets of Bombay, down the streets of Pedro and one of the twin sisters, she is wearing the western clothes, a mini skirt and short. And the other twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab, complete body covered, except the face and the hands up the rest. And if they are walking down the streets of Pedder Road, and if round the corner there is a hooligan, there is a ruffian who is waiting for a catch, who is waiting to tease a girl. I am asking you a question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the mini skirts are short, or will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab? <laughs> but naturally, he will tease the girl wearing the western clothes. Let's analyze what do the Hindu scriptures have to speak about modesty. It is mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 33, verse number 19. It says that when Brahma has made you a dame, when Brahma has made you a woman, you should lower your gaze and should not look up. You should put your feet together and you should not reveal that which the garment and the veil conceals. So Rigve says that the woman should wear the veil. They should lower the gaze and should not stare. It's further mentioned in Rigve, book number 10, hymn number 85, verse number 30. It says, unlovely is the person, is the husband who covers his thighs with the garment of the wife. So Rigve says that wearing the clothes of the opposite sex is prohibited. It's further mentioned in Mahavir Charit, Act 2, page number 71. That Rama says, when Parusharam comes, Rama tells his wife Sita that he is our elder. Please lower your gaze and put on the veil. Rama tells his wife Sita, put on the veil and lower your gaze. If you read historical books, the books talking about the coinage of the age of Gupta and post Gupta age, there are coins which have women wearing veil, Indian women. Up and the veil goes up to the shoulders. Some go up to the arms. Many Indian women, if you go to the villages, they wear the veil. They cover the head. Some of the women even cover their face. So if we analyze, even the Hindu scriptures say that the woman should wear the veil, that the woman should lower the gaze. It's a pity that Raja Ram Mohan Roy, he might not have read these verses. God willing, if Raja Ram Mohan Roy would have read these verses, even he would have told that the woman should wear the veil. Four years back, I appreciated the Home Minister L.K. Advani for suggesting that the rapist should put to death. Maybe the next Home Minister, he would advise that the woman of India should wear the veil. Yes, brother. Can you state your name and profession? Assalamu alaikum. Yes. My name is Afroz Vasaya. I am a manager in a private limited company. I would like to put one question. It is a common belief of all the religion that God can do everything. Then why can't he become human being? The brother posed the question that all the religions believe that God can do anything and everything. So why can't he become a human being? Most of the religions beside Islam they believe in a philosophy known as anthropomorphism. That is Almighty God, He takes human forms. And they believe in the philosophy that Almighty God is so holy, He doesn't know the shortcomings of human beings. How will a human being feel when he's hurt? How will a human being feel when he's in trouble or in problem? So Almighty God has come down in this world and become a human being to set the rules for the human being. On the face of it, it's a very good logic. But I tell these people, that suppose 
I manufacture a VCR. Do I have to become a VCR to know what is good or what is bad for the VCR? Since I'm the creator, I don't have to become a VCR. I just write an instruction manual that if you want to play the VCR video cassette recorder, put in the video cassette and press the play button. If you want to fast forward, press the FF button. If you want to stop, press the stop button. Don't drop it from a height, it will get spoiled. Don't immerse it in water, it will get damaged. I'll write an instruction manual. Similarly, Almighty God, since He is the creator of the human beings, He does not have to become a human being to know what is good or what is bad for the human being. What does He do? He chooses a man amongst men and He reveals a revelation. And the last and final revelation for the human beings, it is the glorious Quran. The do's and don'ts. If I agree with you for sake of argument that Almighty God can do anything and everything, so why can't He become a human being? If I agree with you for sake of argument that God can do anything and everything, that He can even become a human being, if God becomes a human being, He ceases to be God. Because God and human beings have got different qualities. Almighty God, He is immortal. Human beings are mortal. You can't have a person who is immortal and mortal at the same time. God has got no beginning. Human beings have a beginning. You can't have a person who has a beginning and no beginning at the same time. Almighty God has got no end. Human beings have an end. You can't have a person who has an end and no end at the same time. It's meaningless. So either you can have God or you can have man. You can't have a God man. It doesn't make sense. Human beings, we require to eat. Almighty God does not require to eat. Allah says in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 14 Almighty God feeds everyone but does not require to be fed We human beings require rest and sleep Almighty God does not require rest If I agree with you for sake of argument Almighty God can do anything and everything In that same argument Almighty God can even tell a lie It is ungodly to tell a lie The moment God tells a lie He it to be God If I agree with you God can do everything God Almighty can even be unjust but the moment God does injustice he ceases to be God Allah says in the Quran Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse 40 that almighty God is never unjust in the least degree if almighty God wants he can forget but to forget is ungodly Allah says in Surah Taha chapter 20 verse 52 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgets the moment almighty God forgets he ceases to be God if Almighty God wants, He can make a mistake. But to make a mistake is ungodly. Allah says in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 52, that Almighty God never makes a mistake. The moment God makes a mistake, it's easy to be God. Nowhere in the Quran it is mentioned that God can do everything. What Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 1, is, Inna Allah la kulli shayin qadir. That verily, Allah has power over all things. It's mentioned in several places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 106. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 109. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 284. In Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse 29. In Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 77. In Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 1, Allah says, Inna Allah la kulli shayin qadir. For verily, Allah has power over all things. Allah says in Surah Buruj, chapter number 85, verse number 16, that Allah is the doer of all he intends. Whatever he intends, he can do. But Almighty God will never intend telling a lie, will never intend making a mistake, he will never intend becoming a human being, he will only intend things which are godly. Hope that answers the question. Next.